Okay, so that last section was just introducing you to the idea that our Minkowski metric can be, or the inner product of the Minkowski metric can be understood in terms of something which is what we call an indefinite quadratic form. And we've seen that this is just something which is taking the components and squaring them and then adding the components with a relative plus or minus and the number of pluses and minuses defines what we call the signature of the quadratic form. And so that was just introducing the concept of these quadratic forms. And now I'm going to discuss about these lead groups, the special orthogonal groups, and we're going to realize that the special orthogonal groups now are going to be the group of transformations that preserve an indefinite quadratic form. So one way that you can understand and realize what the components of now any special orthogonal group of now arbitrary signature, called PQ, you can now realize that the group elements that this group corresponds to are going to be the, well now understood as matrix elements, they're going to be the matrices of transformations that effectively are now going to preserve an indefinite quadratic form of signature PQ. And so now another way that we can kind of express this indefinite quadratic form, we've already seen is just to write down some matrix of coefficients that correspond to these plus and minus numbers here, essentially. And so if you write down now a general matrix that has only diagonal elements, and so for its diagonal elements, we're going to start with minus 1. So we're going to have p lots of minus 1s. And then we're going to have... So the first p by p block is just going to be a diagonal matrix with minus 1s. And then we have another q by q block that just has plus 1s on the diagonal. And so this now gives just effectively a matrix of these coefficients, which we call eta. And we can now rewrite this indefinite quadratic form as basically just now in the matrix notation. Now we could write it in the tensor notation as just eta mu nu, and then times our components, which I'm calling u. And so that just gets us back to what we've seen before with how the metric is going to work. But now we're just realizing that all this is is just some set of coefficients, which is controlling how we square and add these components. But we can equally just express things as matrices and realize, well, we're going to take the vector u, which is some column vector, and then when we do these sums in the matrix language, we just need to turn one of these column vectors into a row vector. And so you'll realize that this condition is equally stated as u transpose eta u. So this is now just two different ways to express this same information here. You can just use the matrix language with this matrix of coefficients or just realize it using our sum convention. But now I'm going to focus on this expression for our quadratic form as it's going to be the most useful or we're going to be able to use it to relate quite nicely to things that we've seen before. So maybe I'll just put that in this little box. So this is just how we express our quadratic form. And now what we're going to be able to realize is that this group, SOPQ, is going to be somehow some group of transformations that's going to have a representation that acts on these U vector objects. And we're going to now see that the group elements are going to be the elements that leave this quadratic form invariant. So what exactly do I mean by that? 
Well, first of all, we're going to realize that we're going to have elements of SOPQ. I'm just going to give them a general name of lambda. This is just going to be some matrix representation of an element SOPQ. And so we're going to now realize that any lambda SOPQ matrix is going to preserve this indefinite quadratic form, which basically means that U, the quadratic form, is equivalent to the same quadratic form, but now with this transformation applied to our vectors. So if our transformation is to preserve our quadratic form, that means it's going to have to satisfy this following relation. And so now let's massage this a little bit and see what it's basically telling us. So let's work with the left hand, the right hand side. If we take this first transpose, it's going to give us a U transpose lambda transpose, and then an eta lambda U. And so now if I compare this, which I've written here, with now the original left hand side, these two expressions are going to have to be equal. And now if I put in some suggestive brackets, we can now realize this expression is now also telling us that this in the red bracket has to be equal to this, which we can then arrive at being the relation that we'd stated previously that our now Lorentz transformations had to satisfy. They have to essentially leave the metric invariant. But now we've realized this in a more general setting. This is now a general requirement that's required of any SOPQ matrix. And it just has to now leave this eta matrix, which if you remember, specified our quadratic form, it just has to leave that matrix invariant. So just to highlight a special case of these now indefinite quadratic forms, if we look at the special case where P is zero, i.e. we have no negative contributions to the form, we just consider a distance formula that's plus. Obviously this is going to reproduce a, a Euclidean-like distance formula. But now we'll see in the kind of trivial SO zero Q case, what well, we're going to see that this group is now essentially just the same thing as SO of dimension Q. And we can understand the form which is going to or the form which is going to be now preserved by this group SOQ is going to be essentially just a matrix with all plus ones down the diagonal, which is just a Q by Q identity matrix. And so this condition now effectively reduces to what we've already seen as the orthogonality condition, essentially that lambda transpose, now with a trivial identity in there, basically lambda transpose lambda has to be equal to 1, which we might now recognize as the orthogonality condition for these matrices. And so now this, which we've already said, is now just how we generalize this orthogonality condition to a more general um, quadratic form that also includes negatives. And so this is what we would sometimes call a pseudo-orthogonality condition. Pseudo-orthogonal in that there are some negative signs in there. So I just want to kind of conclude this now by giving a statement about what these groups are really doing. Well, we can see what they're doing is now preserving this quadratic, potentially indefinite quadratic form. But now what we should realize is that this quadratic form is saying something quite fundamental about our geometry. We've seen it's connected to the metric tensor. We've seen how we use this norm to effectively define 
geometric quantities, like the distance between points in our geometry. And so what this group of transformations is going to do is it's effectively going to leave this whatever geometric structure is implied by our quadratic form, it's going to leave that geometric structure invariant. And so how we can understand this, well, let's just consider briefly a simple case in which we have a zero on the negatives and we're just looking at essentially the groups S and Q. We can understand these groups. Let's just take the simple example of SO3. One way to view SO3 is that it's the group that is now going to preserve the Euclidean form. And so any SO3 transformation is going to keep the Euclidean distances between two points an invariant. Quite intuitively, we know that if we take any three-dimensional space and we just rotate it, i.e we perform an SOQ transformation. That doesn't change scales or distances in any way. It keeps distances fixed. And we now see this in that this group with this signature is effectively now preserving this quadratic form, which is what we use to define our geometric structure. And so then in general, any geometric structure which is specified by such an indefinite form is then going to be, or well, that geometric structure is then going to be preserved by an SOPQ transformation. So the Lorentz group, at least the Lorentz group that has the same dimension as our real universe, which is one time and three space, we can now really nicely understand the Lorentz group elements. They are the transformations that preserve the Minkowski quadratic form, which is a, a line element, a geometric feature, which is built using this indefinite quadratic form. So any Lorentz transformation now is going to preserve an uh, inner product or a Minkowski inner product of this form. So in summary then, I introduced the notion of an inner product, which is just how we view or what we view the metric as doing is it defines a, a way to take an inner product between two vectors. And we of course understand this as a metric lowering one of the indices and then that resulting one form eating the other vector. But we've now seen a nice way to kind of realize these norms or inner products using a quadratic form and we then saw how we could realize the Minkowski metric as just being kind of the coefficients on that quadratic form and then we derive just by fairly simply looking at this expression that any now SOPQ transformation is just going to be some matrix or group element such a SOPQ transformation is going to now preserve a quadratic form with the same signature. And we've said that these quadratic forms can then be understood as defining some kind of geometric structure, i.e. the Euclidean quadratic form with just a zero here defines the Euclidean line element, and then we have our Minkowski version with the negatives here, so this is just now a nice way to understand the Lorentz group. It's just the group of transformations that preserve the indefinite quadratic form of signature 1, 3, which we've seen just corresponds to the Minkowski line element.